Thanks everybody for coming. And uh, my title was deliberately vague when I first gave it because I wasn't sure what I was going to talk about. So I just thought, well, I'll talk about some seabirds. We'll call it a seabird medley. And uh, I've been asked to identify all four species uh, in this first slide. And I will certainly do that. Uh, on the left is a pair of red-tailed tropic birds. And then the next one is a white tern. And then is a laysan albatross. And then a black-footed albatross. And uh, when I started making this presentation about a week ago, I, th I thought I was going to talk about all four of these species. And then I started putting the different parts of it together. And I thought, there's just so much great stuff to say about all these species, I'm not going to have time. So I'd, I'm only going to talk about the first two, only the, the red-tailed tropic bird and the white tern. I'm not, not going to talk about albatross. But I really like the pictures, but I didn't want to take them off. And I left them up there just to show you. So, so I'm going to start with the red-tailed tropic bird part. And the title for this part is National History and Conservation of Red-Tailed Tropic Birds on Oahu. And I hope that you can recognize this spot. We are not far from there right now. This, uh, I'm standing at the uh, Lanai Lookout parking lot right here, looking back toward Hanama Bay. So these, these are birds that nest very close to where we are right now. Uh, and I thought I'd start with that because I, I think it's a species that uh, many people are familiar with, and if not, you should be. So I want to I educate you about what red-tailed tropic birds today and how close they actually nest to where we live in Honolulu. And, you know, Oahu really is an amazing place for seabirds. It, you know, holds the, the bulk of the state's population, but it actually is one of the best places in Hawaii to see seabirds. We have quite a few different species. A lot of them are on the offshore islands, but several of them are found right on Oahu, right in our backyard, and they're easy to see and also easy to study. So I want to give a little bit of background about tropic birds. Um, they're placed in their own family, the Phaethontidae. Uh, they're actually not thought to be all that close related to any other birds, but they're placed in an order, the Pelicaniforms, which also includes pelicans, boobies, frigipers, and cormorants. Uh, there are three species that I have pictured here. At the top is the red-tailed tropic bird, which I'll talk about today. Um, you can identify it because it has a red bill and red tail streamers, which are a little hard to see. Um, this is a, a fairly common breeder in Hawaii, um, at least in a few spots. The second species is the white-tailed tropic bird right here. It has a yellow bill and white tail streamers. This is the one, if you've been to Kauai and looked at the Kalalau lookout, this is the tropic bird you see there. They're more widespread than the red-tailed tropic bird. Um, they nest primarily up in the mountains, so you don't, you don't, their, their nests are hard to find or at least hard to get to. Um, and then the third species is the red-billed tropic bird here. And this is just a rare visitor to Hawaii. I actually took this picture also from Lanai Lookout. So it's a very rare visitor. Um, it breeds primarily in the eastern, eastern Pacific, the Galapagos Islands and some islands off Mexico. It has a red, a red bill, but white tail streamers. So those are, the, those are the characters to look for to identify tropic birds. Why is it here for them? Uh, the, the tail is a, uh, it's a, it's a character that the, is used in mate selection. So it's, it was. Uh, like how the, well, the peacock has a really big, colorful tail. Um, it's because females choose males that have tails like that. Well, in tropic birds, both sexes choose mates that have long tails. So it's a product of sexual selection. Um, a little more about the red-tailed tropic bird. Um, they are uh, common in tropical and subtropical oceans around the world. This yellow color here shows their range. Here are the Hawaiian Islands. The global population is about nine to 12,000 breeding pairs. So there's not that many, even worldwide. And about 25% of them are found in Hawaii. So although they have a, a wide global distribution, Hawaii is an especially important place for them. We have a, a large portion of the world's population here in the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, and this shows a map of the main Hawaiian Islands or the southeastern Hawaiian Islands with the main red-tailed tropic bird colonies. So here, I've called this one Halona because it's, it's close to Halona Point, which is the, where that fishing shrine, that's Halona Point is out near, uh, just east of here. Um, last year, there were 63 pairs that nested there. The, the other colonies are Kilauea Point on Kauai. They have probably around 200 pairs. And then Lehua Islet, just north of Niihau, has an even larger number of pairs. And that's really it. There are probably a few pairs that nest on the north shore of Molokai. There's a few that nest on a little island off the tip of Kohala here on the big island. Um, 
but that's not very many in the main islands. So I just said that Hawaii has 25% of the global population, but most of those are in the Northwest Islands, Midway, Lay Sand, French Frigate Shoals. Um, that's where most of the birds are. Um, so there's not very many colonies here. They're relatively small, but they are important in the conservation of the species. And I'll talk more about that in a couple minutes. Uh, the breeding phenology or the seasonality uh, of tropic birds. So here's a graph that shows the months in which eggs are laid in blue and the eggs hatch in red. And then when the chicks fledge in green or yellow, whatever that is. Um, so you can see the, we are, the, the majority of eggs are laid in, in uh, February and March and April. Uh, and then right now in, in April, we're at the peak of chick hatching right now. So a lot of the tropic birds have little chicks right now. They're super cute when they're little. I'll show some pictures in a minute. And then the, the nesting season is fairly long. So, so a lot of the chicks don't fledge until July, August, or even into October. Uh, they have a, a very elaborate and beautiful, yes, question. I'll get to that. I'll get to that. You're jumping ahead. Um, the, uh, they have an elaborate and beautiful courtship display. Um, so this is not a video or time lapse or anything. These are four different birds. And they have this kind of backward wheeling. If I had a video, they would be going in a, in a circle like this in a clockwise direction where they usually face into the wind and they flap and they make this squawking sound. Um, so this is how they choose their mates. And these are the same same four birds a couple seconds later. So they're kind of rotating through this this circular display. Always they're they're making a lot of noise and they they display these these tail feathers to show what a good mate they would be. Where do you see these birds? This this photo was taken from the Nile Lookout. So very close to here. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I'll I'll show a map in just a minute. But almost all the pictures I'm showing today of these of these birds were taken right here like just you know, less than a mile from Hanama Bay. That's, that's why I wanted to focus on this species first because it's one you can see right here and they're actually really easy to see if you go to the right place at the right time. <laughs> um, so the, the nest and eggs, um, on Oahu at least, they normally nest in rocky crevices and caves. So this is a nest here on Oahu and uh, that rocky coastline that you see like from here, between here and Sandy Beach, is full of these little pukas in the rock. They, tropic birds love these things. They're like little natural nest cavities. They're protected from the rain. They don't get too much sun on them. Uh, they're great places to nest. In other places, here, this is a, a tropic bird on, on Midway. Sometimes they nest next to tree roots or under vegetation. This is another bird on Midway that's under an alpaca bush. Um, this is a, uh, an old pillbox on Wake Island and there's a tropic bird nest inside that pillbox. So they're not all that picky. They like to be in the shade. Um, and that's what the egg looks like. They're kind of, they're a little bit smaller than a, than a chicken egg and much more spotted. Um, so I said the chicks are cute. Here they are. Here's one probably just only a day old. Here's the egg that it hatched out of. And you might think, how can that bird hatch out of that egg? And the answer is it's mostly fluff. It's mostly down. They are actually really small, and like if you put you know, pick that bird up in your hand, it would only it would only weigh about an ounce. They're very small when they hatch, and they're super fluffy. Um, and they also vary in color. This one is kind of a grayish color. This one's all white. Um, I don't know what purpose that has, if any, or if it's just just the way things are. Um, and uh, the parents, both parents, brood the chick. They all, also both parents take turns incubating the egg. The eggs hatch in. 45 days, uh, and this is the male here. This is he's not happy that I'm looking that I'm so close to their nest. They they have this defensive display where they hold their wings out and puff themselves up, try to look as big as possible to scare the predator away. And the female here is is closer to the chick, and she has it's hard to see, but they have this really beautiful kind of pink wash to their feathers. Uh, they get that only during the nesting season, and after the, the chicks uh, hatch. It's, uh, the parent actually will hold them under the wing like this. They do it a lot. It's really makes makes for nice pictures. Uh, um, so the uh, the the parents are out at sea. They catch fish and squid, bring it back to the nest, and they feed the chick by regurgitation, which many seabirds do. But there's one really unusual thing about tropic birds. Most seabirds feed when they feed their chick the chick puts its head inside the adult's mouth or at least next to the mouth 
In tropic, we're just the opposite. The adult puts its head inside the chick's mouth. It looks like the chick is swallowing the adult. It's really strange. So this, as far as I know, this is the only seabird that does this. So the, the, the adult puts its beak and sometimes half the head inside the chick's mouth. And you can see how big this chick is. They actually get um, bigger and heavier than the adults when they're being fed. And uh, this chick is about three weeks old, and that's about when the, the parents start to leave them alone a lot. There won't be an adult with them. And from then on, they're fed less than once a day. Before that, the adults stay with them most of the time, and the parent will feed them. Uh, they'll regurgitate fish to them one or, or several times a day, because when they're small, they need to eat more often, just, just like a, you know, a, a young child. Um, and then when they get bigger, you'll see this is a very common pose in tropic birds. I have more pictures of them like this. Tropic birds scream. They are super loud. When you get close to them, they just screech. And it's like a blood curdling screech. And it's, it's meant to scare predators away. And I think it might actually work sometimes. It's super loud. Uh, and even the little ones do it. Here's another one. This is a much bigger chick. They can make an even louder sound. Um, and the chicks fledge after about 82 days on average. So this is, it's almost three months that the parents are feeding the chicks. It takes a long time. Um, and with the, the range 68 to 104 days. Um, and at other locations where people have studied tropic birds, the range is 83 to 94 days. So it's actually shorter here on Oahu than elsewhere in the world. And we don't know exactly why this is, but the best explanation is that there are really rich foraging waters close to Hawaii. So these birds are able to bring back more food per day than, other, than tropic birds in other places, and the chicks grow faster. So this is, a, this is a good place for tropic birds to be. Um, the overall, uh, overall nest success is 60%. That means 60% of the nests end up fledging a chick, which is really good. Um, about 78% of the eggs hatch, and 78% of the, of, the, 78 of the chicks that hatch end up fledging. And again, this is really good. On Curiatal, where people have studied tropic birds, the average is lower, 17 to 38%, depending on the year. And on Midway, again, a little bit lower. So despite all the predators and things on Oahu, um, this is a really good place for tropic birds to live. And I think it has to do with the abundance of food nearby. And maybe also this, this relatively small number of tropic birds that nest here. On Midway, there are thousands of these birds. And they're all competing for the same food. And they're all starting from the same place. So when they go out and look for food, they're trying to find food at the same time as many, many other tropic birds. Here, there's not that many. So I think the food, on average, is a little bit easier to find. Question? Kind of I'll get to that, too. Yep, we're, we're getting there. Um, so I talked about the, the birds foraging at sea. So one study that, I, that I've done in collaboration with researchers from the, the US Geological Survey um, is to track these birds at sea using GPS tags. So this is a small GPS tag. It's just a little bigger than a quarter. doesn't weigh very much. And we taped it onto the, the base of the bird's tail feathers. Uh, and this is just, just temporary. It doesn't hurt the bird. They don't like it, but it doesn't hurt them. Um, and then we'll come back a week later or 10 days later, retrieve the tag, and there'll be data that, the, that, that shows us where the birds went. So this is really valuable information that was almost impossible to get until relatively recently, until this, the technology was developed to have these really small GPS tags. Question. Yes? Uh, when you put the tag on are you assured 100% that they come back to the same nest? Like yes, that? yes. We only do this with, with birds while they're nesting. Because we, they, they, we did it with, with chicks, with birds that had chicks in the nest. So we knew they'd come back to feed their chick. Um, they sometimes came back without the tag. Sometimes the tape yeah. didn't hold and the, my tag was somewhere at the bottom of the ocean. Um, but we did this on three colonies. We did it at Kilauea Point on Kauai, on Lehua Islet, and then also here on Oahu. And you can see the, the track. So each line is one trip by a bird. So the tropic birds that are nesting here make mostly shorter trips. Well, these are still, you know, you know, 50 or 100 miles. So they're actually going pretty far south, but almost all going south. Um, and we had one, uh, one bird that made this huge long trip, you know, way south of the Big Island. And that bird was gone for 14 days in a row. I actually thought it wasn't coming back. I thought maybe the bird had died or something. And then I came back after two weeks. And there it was, and it still had the tag, and it had two weeks' worth of data on it, so I was really happy. Um, and the birds from Kauai and Lakua go mostly north, so it's interesting. They've kind of separated the, the foraging environment based on where they, where they nest. One quick question. Mm -hmm. 14 days on that bird, 
Do you stay airborne all the time or do you rest? No, they, they land on the water and rest and they, they fish by, by diving headfirst into the water. They don't go very deep just a few feet under the surface, but they're catching fish and squid that are close to the surface. And they will rest on the water, so they're not necessarily flying that whole time. So threats, and here we're going to talk about the predators you asked about. The number one threat to, to tropic birds, at least on Oahu, is non-native predators, especially mongoose, feral cats, and rats. On the right here, this is a tropic bird egg that's been chewed open by a rat. So this is not a natural pattern that you see in an egg that is hatched. The rat has kind of chewed a, you know, a saddle out from the middle and eaten the embryo inside. Um, this is the remains of an almost fully grown chick. Here's the chick's bill over here, and this was killed by a mongoose. And again, here, just scattered feathers and, and down from a, from a chick that was killed. Um, and this is typical of many seabirds in, in Hawaii and elsewhere in the world. Um, a lot of seabirds nest, have, have nested on islands that really did not have any predators before people brought them. So they're not, they're, they're naive in, in a sense. They don't really know what predators are. They're not, they don't nest in a way that makes them safe from predators. They nest directly on the ground. So for an animal like a mongoose, you know, this, this is easy pickings. Um, and prior to humans arriving in, in Hawaii, um, we know that seabirds were much more widespread, much more abundant, um, including tropic birds, including species like albatross and petrels and shearwaters. We still have some species left now, but in the past there were many more, and they were much more widespread. And these non-native predators have really restricted their distribution and made them much less common. Another question. You know, they, they'll try. Um, and I rarely see chicks taken when they're so small that the adult would be with them. So, you know, a tropic bird, they're, they're pretty hardy birds. They can give a good bite. Um, but a determined cat or mongoose could still, they could kill the adult too if they really wanted to. Um, I think an adult tropic bird could, could fend off a rat, um, but not a cat or a mongoose. Mongoose are really tough little animals. They're really fierce. Um, so most of the predation I see uh, is on kind of mid-sized chicks. They're not full size. They're not not that big yet, um, and they're they're actually pretty easy for a cat or a mongoose to kill. So the solution to this is predator trapping, and I've been doing this at the colony out here near Helena Point since 2006. So this is the 11th year I've been trapping predators, and um, I didn't keep great records in the early years. I started, and I've also changed methods over the years, and I have reached what I think is the best method starting in 2013. And just since 2013 at this colony, I've caught 92 mongoose, 327 rodents. I don't, I don't know if they're all mice or rats, but just rodents, and three feral cats. And I think mongoose are really the most serious predator. Um, they, they eat a lot more than a rat, and they're, just, they're generally a lot more aggressive. And I think that's, they're responsible for most of the predation. So I think it's, it's surprising to people just how many of these predators are out there. There's really a lot of them. Question? They, they do. They do. And the eggs are not left unattended very often. There's almost always one of the parents sitting on the egg. Um, so uh, I showed that one picture of a, the, the egg that was chewed open by a rat. That was probably an egg that had been abandoned first, and the rat found it when there was no adult on it. Um, but sometimes, they, you know, the adults, the, you know, the male and female, they are, they're, not coordinated, they're, they don't, they're not coordinated, and they both might leave for a short time. And while they're both gone, the egg is very vulnerable. Um, so, I, but uh, you know, a mongoose would you know could drive an adult off an egg or a chick if they wanted to. Um, so this is not what I set out to do. I wanted to study tropic birds. I didn't want to become a pest control specialist. But it became obvious right away that unless predators were controlled, there would not be very many or even any tropic birds left to study. So this has become a portion of my study. I, I have to trap predators if I want to study tropic birds. So that's what I do. And it has been, I, I would say, fairly successful. So here's a, a graph that shows year on the x-axis and then on the y-axis the number of eggs laid in blue, number of eggs hatched in pink, and the number of chicks fledged in yellow. So when I first started working here in 2005, um, there were uh, five chicks that fledged. I don't know exactly how many eggs were laid. And then I started trapping, and I, and I saw a number of chicks that ended up being eaten. And I started trapping predators right away. 
and I didn't do it that consistently at first. It wasn't all that effective, and it's gotten better and better over time. And you can see that this colony has grown. So that last year there were 68 nests by I think 63 different pairs. If if the if the egg is eaten early in the nesting cycle, the pair may may relay. They only lay one egg at a time, but if they lose one egg, they might lay another one. So it's there's generally been a, a you know a pretty dramatic increase in the number of pairs and also in the success of the pairs when they're nesting. And this is I get asked well you know what if what if this is happening everywhere? Maybe it's not your predator trapping. There's no place else in Hawaii where this is happening. This, it's not a you know a region wide or you know worldwide trend. Tropic birds are not increasing on their own. This is because of the trapping, and I'm I'm very confident that if it wasn't for the trapping, the numbers would be back down here. They might be surviving, but just in very small numbers. Um, sometimes people ask, what can we do? And the first would be uh, enforcing litter laws, litter littering laws. So here's here's a map. So we're about over here in Alhama Bay. Um, Sandy Beach is over this direction, and this is where most of the colony is. Um, this is the fishing shrine by Helena Point, and unfortunately, people leave food here a lot. And I, I know it's there's a reason for that, and it's well intentioned, but this attracts rats and mongoose. Um, and after they're done eating the food that's that's left here, they come over and go for the tropic birds. Um, this was this is kind of a strange thing. This is one of the the, the second pullout past when I look out, and someone had made essentially a, like a shrine. There was a you know a carved tiki and cinder blocks, but they also left food offerings. I don't know what the purpose was. It was, it was kind of a weird thing, really, and it's not happening anymore. Food that was left attracted mongoose, so I would put one of my traps right next to this, and I would catch one every week. Um, so that's one thing is just don't don't litter and if you've ever walked along this shoreline you know that every one of these pullouts has a garbage pile on the Mackay side right next to it so I'm, I know that this is contributing to the abundance of rats you know, and, and mongoose in the area another uh, let me go back so I use two I, I thank you for reminding me I actually meant to talk about this um, so this is uh, this is uh, the main trap I use for mongoose, this is a kill trap. It's like a giant rat trap. Um, and it has chicken wire in the front with holes cut that will keep cats out. So I'm not trying to, I'm not kill trapping cats. Um, I'm aiming for mongoose, so a cat cannot fit through there. And it also has two of, two of these layers of chicken wire with holes cut on opposite sides. So the mongoose can, it has a very slender body, so we can make that turn. A tropic bird could not make that turn. It's too big to fit through there. So I don't. I want to make sure I don't trap tropic birds either. Um, so it's you know it's not it's not pleasant, but it's humane. The other thing about the holes cut in the mesh is that it forces the mon the mongoose as it enters the trap. It puts its head right where the trap is going to hit it. So it's killed instantly. So it's it's not pleasant, but it's humane, and that's important too. Uh, and this is uh, uh, and an automatically resetting rat trap that's made in New Zealand by a company called Good Nature. And it's, I, I use regular snap traps sometimes too, like you might use in your house, and those work. But once you've caught a rat, then the trap is not functional anymore. You're not going to catch another one until you come back and reset it. So this trap runs on, a, this is a, a CO2 canister like you might use for a, a pellet gun. And it can fire 24 times on one canister. And it has, uh, you can put a bait inside here. Um, and again, this is very humane. New Zealand has very strict standards for humaneness of predator control. Um, so that's the that's the main technique I use to control rats. How much does that one cost? This one costs one hundred and forty dollars each. So, which is expensive, but it saves labor because it's working even when I'm not out there. I don't have to go back and reset it because I I go out, I go out and visit this colony about once every week or maybe two weeks. So I want to make sure that there's something protecting the birds all the time. Yeah, question. Where do you get that good nature trap? You, in, in the past, you had to order them from New Zealand, but they actually just a few months ago, uh, they now have a U.S. distributor. Uh, they're based in California, and they're called Automatic Traps. So if you, if you go to automatictraps.com, you'll find their website, and you can order these traps yourself. <laughs> so, and they, they work pretty well. Um, they're a little bit finicky to set up at first, but they, they, they do work well. You know, they are expensive. Like, if you're going to do this in your home, I'm not sure it's worth the money. You're there every day, so you could you could reset a rat, you know, a snap trap yourself. 
Um, but they're very effective and they can remove more rats faster than this map perhaps could. So, and again, I want to emphasize that this is, this is not what I set out to do. I, I, didn't want to, I did not want to trap rats and mongoose, but this is what you have to do if you want to have seabirds in, in, around. Um, so that's, that's what I do, and I try to do it in an effective and humane way as possible. The cats. The cats. Um, I don't see very many cats out there. I think it's just not a very attractive environment for cats. Um, and in the past, I used live traps, and that's how I caught the traps. And then I would take them to the Humane Society, and they were never very happy with me because these are these are not adoptable cats. These are wild cats that no one's really going to want. Um, but they still take them, so that's 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 where I took them. Okay. Um, I also just want to mention briefly um, where the, the you know, I mentioned these, these sources of garbage that might be attracting rats. Unfortunately, I think Hanama Bay itself is a major source of mongoose. Um, the garbage cans here are full of mongoose day and night. Um, so this, I think, is actually a big mongoose source. And I've talked to the staff here about trying to get covered garbage cans just to make the garbage less accessible. And they said it's partly the expense, those are more expensive. But also, if they make it too hard for people to throw their garbage away, they'll throw it on the ground. Now, that, does, that seems lame to me, but that's what they said. And I really, I'd like to talk to someone again. Um, it's, I, I wish it wasn't like that, but that's, that's I, I, I can believe it with, with some people. I hope that most people will be happy to go to the extra effort to dispose of their garbage properly. Out that's right. That's right. When it's really windy, yep. If it's really windy, it can blow right out. Um, another threat to, to tropic birds and other seabirds is offshore wind energy development. Now, you know, this is an alternative energy, and in general, I support that. But you have to choose the sites properly and carefully. So I mentioned the tracking study that, that I did before. That was actually funded by the Bureau of Offshore Energy uh, Management. Um, so they're the ones that there's a, you know, a wind farm proposal. They're the ones that regulate where it can go, you know, who gets the contract, all that kind of stuff. And they, bef before they agreed to let anyone build a wind farm in Hawaii, they want to know what potential environmental impacts it might have. And one of the impacts is that seabirds can collide with the turbines. You know, this, this happens with turbines on land, too. It can happen in the ocean, except if the bird hit the turbine and dropped, it would just drop in the ocean and you'd never see it. So we wouldn't really know, we wouldn't have much evidence that that was happening. So they actually funded the tracking work. And here are these two black polygons. Po polygons. Uh, about two years ago, uh, this, this uh, BOEM, the Office of Energy Management, um, put out what they call, uh, what, what they term a wind, uh, a call. So they have, they're proposing development of wind energy in some offshore areas, and they're accepting proposals for, from companies to develop the turbines. And the two areas they chose were just south of Oahu here and then just northwest of Kaena Point. Um, and at least from a tropic bird standpoint, this is a terrible area. Um, and you know, you can, you, this, you can see this is the main area where they forage. You know, the, the, a lot of their shorter duration trips get just to the edge of it, but when they make longer trips, they... And the other thing to think about is these, these are really large turbines. The, uh, each rotor can be 80 meters long, 80 yards long. They might be 300 meters tall. And this makes them more efficient, but uh, for, um, and for species like, for seabirds like, like albatross and shearwaters that fly close to the ocean surface, they're not a big hazard. Tropic birds fly high off the water, right through what's called the rotor swept zone. So the area where the rotors are spinning is right at the height where many tropic birds fly. Not all of them, but many of them. So this, this was a concern. Um, and I've actually heard unofficially that, that BOEM is, is no longer considering this area, and it's at least in part because of the potential damage to seabirds. I don't know if that's true yet, but I've heard that unofficially. So, you know, I, I support the development of wind energy, but I think it's also important to choose the site responsibly. Um, and the last threat I want to talk about is climate change, um, specifically sea level rise. So Midway Atoll has the, by far the biggest colony of red-tailed tropic birds, at least in Hawaii. There's uh, several thousand pairs that nest there. Um, but as you probably know, this, this atoll, the maximum elevation is like, is like 
20 feet. And most of it is about six feet. So even like large wave events, like large storm driven waves, wash over parts of the island and wash away bird nests. This happens every year. Uh, in 2011, the uh, tsunami from Japan. So here, here, here are the two, the, the, the islands at Midway Atoll. Everything in red was washed over by the tsunami. So well over half the island was washed over. Um, these are not, these are albatross, not tropic birds, obviously. But as an example, this is a before and after picture of the same spot. So here's probably you know, a couple hundred albatross nests. This is what was left after the tsunami. So that's a tsunami. That's exceptional. That's a you know, very large wave event. But even before that happened, the same year, um, about 40,000 albatross nests were washed away. And I don't know how many tropic bird nests, but probably hundreds. So, and this is expected to occur with increasing frequency as sea the sea level rises and uh, as storm intensity <coughs> increases. So the, the biggest colonies that we have in Hawaii, and these are some of the biggest colonies in the world, are under pretty serious threat. And it's not an immediate threat, but it's a long-term threat. So those colonies may not persist that much longer. And that's one reason I think it's important to help colonies like the one we have here, which is safe from sea level rise, is to help the tropic birds here, allow them to increase. And in the long run, those are going to be very important for the conservation of the species. OK, this was a reminder for me to take a drink of water. And that's, that's the end of the tropic bird portion. And I just have these two pictures to, for you to look at while I drink my water. It takes just a few months. <clears throat> when they first fledge, the bill is black. And then uh, over the first, I'd say, three, four months, it gradually becomes red. So it, it first will be like a kind of like a, a darker, dusky red. And then I think by six months or so, it's, it's bright red. They don't get the tail streamers for probably about a year, though. Another question. Yeah, that's around? that's a good question. So the, the question was, um, did the chicks go back to where they hatch from, and did the colonies mix? And the answer is uh, to both of those is yes. Most chicks will go back to the colony where they hatched. I don't know, you know, probably ninety-five or maybe even more, ninety-five percent or maybe even more chicks will go back to the colony where they hatched from, but not all of them. Um, at this colony, I actually. Uh, uh, caught one bird that had a band on its leg, um, which was surprising to me because I had not banded any birds at that point, and it was banded on Johnson Island, you know, a th thousand miles south of here, um, by a researcher. Oh, I think about about twelve years before. So for whatever reason, that bird had decided, and, and the bird was nesting there too. So definitely had not uh, had not hatched on Oahu, but it had moved from another colony. So and the same as the same thing has happened in the Northwest Islands. I know people have um, recovered birds that were banded. Uh, between Midway and Cure, and I think between Midway and Le Sam. So most bird, most chicks go back to the island where they hatch, but a few move, and that you know that's how new colonies get started. That's you know so they're they're genetically similar. They're not they're not separated. Okay. Next, I want to talk about white terns, and uh, I'm going to talk about work that I did, but also with a whole lot of help from Rich Downs, who's sitting in the back here. Um, so if there are any hard questions, I'm going to refer those to Rich. Um, and this is, uh, uh, so the title here, Distribution Abundance and Breeding Biology of White Terns on Oahu. Um, and this work was, was partly funded by the, by the Hawaii Division of Forestry and Wildlife. And I'll talk about some reasons for that um, in, in, in a minute. Um, and first, I want to just start with a little back, uh, background on white terns. So like, just like with the red-tailed tropic bird, they are found worldwide in tropical oceans. They're more widespread in the Pacific, just because there's a lot more islands in the Pacific. Um, they are found in the Atlantic and the Indian Oceans, but there are only a few islands that they nest on. But they are found globally um, in tropical oceans. Um, and just like the red-tailed tropic bird, there are many thousands of them in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. Midway, you know, Lay Sand, Curie are loaded with them, lots of them there. In the main Hawaiian Islands, they occur only on Oahu. Not on Kauai, not on Maui, not the big island, only on Oahu. So this is kind of a strange thing. And for those of us who live on Oahu, it's a really cool thing. And not only that, they occur only in Honolulu. Not on the windward side, not on the North Shore. They're only in Honolulu. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not joking. It's a, really, it's a strange thing, and I'm going to talk 
about some reasons why I think that might be. Um, yeah. The wingspan of the, uh, compared to the wingspan of the tropic bird. Uh, the the tropic bird is is bigger. The tropic bird wingspan be about like that, and the white turn wingspan be about like that. Yeah, they're still good size. You know the the, the white turns they only weigh about 120 grams, so about four ounces. So they look big, but they're actually they don't weigh that much. It's because the, the feathers make birds look a lot bigger than they really are. If you looked at a bird's skeleton, they're actually really small. The feathers make them look a lot bigger. And also, white terns have really long wings and a long tail. So that makes them look bigger than they are. But that's all made of feathers, which weigh you know almost nothing. OK, a little more background. Um, so the, the white tern population on the island of Oahu was listed by the state of Hawaii as threatened in 1986. And I think this must have been based on its limited distribution only in Honolulu and its small population size. Um, so this is one of the few cases where there's a bird that's listed as, as threatened by the state of Hawaii that's not also listed by the federal government. Um, and I did some surveys back in 2002 uh, throughout Honolulu and found there were about 250 breeding pairs and 700 birds total. Um, and I'm going to make some comparisons to that in a few minutes. And because this bird is so special to Honolulu, it was actually designated as the official city and county bird of Honolulu in 2007. And I think we're still the only county that has an official bird. So, A um, little bit about the, the natural history of white terns. Um, I've called this nesting, but they don't actually make a nest. This is really unusual for a, for a seabird. They lay, their, they lay one egg and they lay it directly on a bare branch or some other surface. So they don't make any, brand, any nest, no sticks, no grass, no nothing. They lay their egg directly on a branch. So this bird sitting here, that's its nest. It's not a real nest, but they just lay their egg right like that. And it seems really precarious, but it seems to work for them. Um, the eggs hatch after 35 days and the chicks are fully feathered when they hatch. And one thing that always strikes me about them is they have really big feet when they hatch. And this helps them hold on tight to their branch because there's no nest for them to sit in. They have to hold tight right where they hatched. Um, both parents feed the chicks um, probably several times a day. Rich and I are trying to figure out exactly how many times a day they get fed. And it's uh, unless someone stands there all day long and counts them, it's actually not that easy to figure out. Um, but they feed them fish and squid. Uh, mostly fish, and again, these are fish that they catch near the surface. They, they don't dive completely under the water like a like a booby or a tropic bird. They're catching fish right at the surface, so they get um, a lot of juvenile fish. They get a lot of uh, uh, needlefish or stickfish. So they're fish that are right at the surface. Another question. Any other birds in the world that, that lay their egg just like that? Not that nest in trees. No. There are, you know, there's birds that nest on the ground that just lay their egg on the, on the ground. They might make a little scrape or something without really adding anything to it. No, as far as I know, it's the only one. Um, and it, it seems like a really bad idea, but it sure works for them. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about some reasons why I think it might not be, actually be such a bad idea. Um, as, the, as the chicks grow, they actually start to wander around in their tree. They probably get bored and they walk around. Um, so this, this chick um, is probably just about ready to fly. I don't remember exactly how old that was. Um, and then they can actually start flying when they're 40 to 45 days old. Uh, there's some variation in there. Um, some chicks develop faster and, and can fly at an earlier age. And then the juveniles, so after, after they can start flying, we call them juveniles. Um, you can recognize them. They have these brownish spots on the wings and on the back. And I didn't point it out before, but the adults have a little bit of bluish color at the base of the bill. And the, the juveniles don't have that. And they may, be, they may fly around for several more weeks, still getting fed by their parents. They probably go back to the same tree in which they hatched. But they also may fly around over a wider area. Um, but the adults keep feeding them for, for several weeks. So now I want to talk about the surveys that, that Rich and I did. And this was kind of a, a repeat of the surveys that that I did in 2002, and this is what the Division of Forest and Wildlife was interested in, in, in funding, 
So this was, it was to provide updated information on the, the numbers of terns and their range. You know, this is a threatened species. We want to know what's happening with it. Is the population secure? Is it increasing? Is it decreasing? And also assess any threats to the population, especially tree trimming and predation. Um, and then while we're at it, we also collected data on breeding success just because we were out there and it wasn't that hard to do. So we basically walked around Honolulu. You may have seen us walking around. Uh, we were, were both pretty distinctive looking and many people began to recognize us and say, hey, there's the turn guys again. So we looked for birds flying around. That, made, that was pretty easy. They're pretty distinctive. But we also spent a lot of time looking down at the ground for turn droppings. So trees that are used by white terns for, for roosting or, or breeding often end up with these clusters of pure white droppings. It's not like a minor bird roost. There's no seeds, there's no bug parts, there's nothing in the droppings. There's, it's like whitewash. It's just pure white. It's actually pretty distinctive. So as you, as you walk around Honolulu, you should look for this too. Um, and I'm sure you recognize it now that you really, so look, see whether there's any bug parts, any you know, plant seeds. Um, and, they're, and if they're white turn droppings, there will not be. It's just plain, pure white. Question? Uh, that is probably about one yard on each side. Maybe, maybe a little less, maybe, maybe two feet on each side. But especially under nests, so that you know, the, the chick spends all day there and poops several times a day. So you end up with a big cluster of droppings. Um, and how, how wide the cluster is depends on how high the nest is and how much wind affects the droppings as they fall from the tree. Probably more than you ever wanted to hear about bird poop. Um, so based on these surveys, we estimated that the total population now is about 2,300 birds. Uh, and that includes about, about 700 breeding pairs or 1,400 breeders and about 900 non-breeders. And the non-breeders are probably younger birds that have not started breeding yet. White terns don't start nesting until they're three or maybe, maybe two years old. So most of those non-breeders are younger birds that we hope will start nesting soon, but not yet. So I said before that the population estimate that I came up with in 2002 was about 700 birds. So this is a 282% increase in 14 years. So this is fantastic news. White terns are doing great in Honolulu. This is, we, we need more good, good wildlife stories in Hawaii. And to me, this is a really good one. So that's a, an increase of 7.7% per year on average. That's about as fast as a seabird population can grow. They only lay one egg at a time. So the reproductive rate is fairly, fairly low, um, but it means that they're, they're doing really well. Um, and just like with the tropic birds, the egg hatching rate is pretty high, about 69% of eggs hatched. The main reason they didn't hatch was if a windstorm blew the egg out of the tree. When we were doing surveys, uh, after, after a big storm, we had a big storm back, was it, was it January? January. And something like 20% of the eggs got blown out of the trees during that storm. So that's probably the biggest source of mortality. There are also some eggs that just are not fertile. They just never hatch. They don't sit on them for a week after week after week, and they never hatch. Um, they, they will, yes. Um, and uh, the chick fledging rate, so once the chick hatches, 83% of the chicks that hatch end up fledging, and that's really good. So not that many chicks die. Some do, and again, one source of mortality is windstorms that blow them out of the tree. There's probably some predation, but the overall breeding success is 57%. Uh, and at Turn Island, at French Frigate Shoals, there's only 30%. So again, the birds here on Oahu are actually doing better than in some of the Northwest Islands where there are no predators. So this is amazing to me. These birds are persisting in this urban environment, tons of predators, lots of disturbance, and they're doing great. Um, and you, uh, so they will, if, they're egg, if they lose their egg, they will lay, lay another. Even if they raise the first chick, they'll lay another egg. So there's some 25% of pairs raise two chicks in one year, and a few raise three. So they're nesting essentially year round. There's no off season for these guys. They just they, they keep nesting over and over and over. And that's one reason that they've been able to increase so fast. That's that I think that largely accounts for their, their pretty rapid population growth on the island. Yes, I will get to that. Yes. They're all they're all over, but that's one of the best places. Um uh oh, seven fifteen already. Holy mackerel. I knew I was gonna say too much. Um so super quick. Um, the breeding seasonality, so what months do they nest in? The top graph here 
is 2016, and we found nests. We found eggs laid in every month with two peaks, one in March, one in October, uh, which is great. So they're nesting year-round, doing really well. In 2002, this is what it looked like. There was only one peak in March, and then not much activity for the rest of the year. Um, so this was surprising to us. Uh, I'm not sure what the difference is. It might be oceanographic conditions. If there's a lot of food out there, the terns nest no matter what <laughs> month it is. Um, I don't know which pattern is more typical, whether this is normal or this is normal, or whether it just varies a lot. And this is important because one of the one of the reasons that um, we were interested in this was to recommend what months of the year are the best months for people to trim trees. One threat is people cutting branches that might have an agar chick on them. And I said before that late fall or late summer and fall is the best time. And in that year, that was true. This year, not at all. So unfortunately for tree trimmers, I don't have any good advice for them anymore. There are turn nests all the, all the time. Turns are nesting all the time. Okay, I'll, tr I'll try to go super fast here. Um, so uh, trees. Uh, turns used a variety of trees, 58 different species. The most commonly used were monkey pod, shower, kukui, banyan, and mahogany. Um, and they like big trees. Uh, this is the diameter. So most of them were 20 inches or more, so almost two feet in diameter. And some of them were really big, you know, four or five feet in diameter. So they like bigger trees in general. And that makes sense. If you have to balance your egg on a branch, it's better if it's a big branch. It's easier. Um, and also, if this year for the first time, you may have heard about this, um, we found one uh, turn sitting on an egg on a railing, not on a tree, but on a, this is the railing of the 4-4 balcony at the State Art Museum. And uh, Rich worked closely with these people, and they had a, a big renovation project scheduled, and they agreed to delay it until this bird was done nesting. Uh, so you asked where they were. Here's a range map. Each dot is one tree used by turns. There are 858 dots on there. I'm not going to count them. Um, but there are concentrations. So the downtown area, you know, the downtown area, one concentration, um, Kalakala Avenue, Kapilani Boulevard, another concentration, Waikiki, lots of turns in Waikiki. Papilani Park, and then the University area and the Punahou area also have a lot of turns. And I'm also going to show a more detailed map, but I'll probably just keep going because I'm running short on time. Um, so there's downtown, lots of lots of turns. Here's the capital, here's the Alani Pass. Those are two of the most dense areas. Here's Milani Street, Milani Mall, lots of turns in there. Uh, let's keep going. So um, what are the threats to white terns? In general, they're doing great. So whatever threats there are, they're not that severe because the terns are really doing well. Um, one one is that is the degree of tolerance these birds have to disturbance, to human disturbance. So we found terns nesting in spots that were incredibly noisy, incredibly urban. So this is the intersection of King Street um, right across from the state capitol. You know, five lanes of traffic, 24-7, it's busy. There's a turn nesting in this tree right here. The noise does not bother them. Here's the on-ramp uh, at Macaulay onto the H1 freeway. There's a turn nest in this Kikui tree right here. Again, super busy, you know, all day and night pretty much. Um, this is a little hard to see. This is this is Club Roxa down on Kapiolani Boulevard. Seems like it might be fairly disturbing to people or birds. No problem for turn. They're outside the front door to Club Roxa. Um, here's Kahala Mall, turns nesting right outside the Starbucks, where people walk past all the time. And here they are nesting at the other Starbucks at Kahala Mall. So both Starbucks at Kahala Mall have turns nesting nearby. Um, and this is, this is to me the most interesting. This is at Bishop Square. So this is an owl decoy that someone's put up. And we we're pretty sure it's because they don't want turns nesting there. And I think it's going to scare them away. Here's a little white turn chick sleeping right next to the Aldi boy. Doesn't bother them at all. They don't care about that. So human disturbance, no. They seem incredibly tolerant of all sorts of noise, traffic, you name it. Um, tree trimming. You know, we thought this was going to be a problem, and it, it is occasionally. We did see a few cases where branches were cut that had an egg or a chick on it. And that's, that's unfortunate. Um, I think most tree trimmers are aware of these birds. They look out for them, and they would, they would not deliberately do this. Um, but part of the reason we did these surveys is to provide a you know a GIS database so we can get then give to tree trimmers of which trees have turns in them so they can use that as a guide whether they you know how, how careful they should be 
And that, that was one of the main important things we did for the, in these surveys. But we also realized after a while that the tree trimming in the long run helps shape the trees in a way that turns like um, in a couple of ways. First, you know, they don't make a nest, so they, they, they try to find a good spot where they can balance their egg. And many trees where a branch is cut, so here's a shower tree, there's a branch cut right here, here's a kukui tree, where the branch is cut, it forms a circular scar with a raised rim. Many terns lay their eggs inside those circular scars. It's like a natural nest cup. And this is way safer than just putting your egg on a bare branch. So they're not making a nest, but they're making use of natural cups that are created by tree trimming. Um, and tree trimming also, you know, white terns, to get to their nest, they have a fairly long wingspan. They need to be able to fly into the crown of the tree and, and get to the interior of the tree. So tree trimming clears out dead branches that might otherwise be obstacles to turns as they fly in. So tree trimming, if done carefully, and I'll, I'll call it arboriculture, not just yeah. tree trimming, because you're carefully shaping the tree, um, can actually be beneficial to turns, but it has to be done carefully. Um, I'm going to finish up super quick here. Um, there, uh, we, we formed uh, a group called the Hui Mono Oku, um, which is a basically a, gr a group of white tern lovers to help share information and promote awareness and education and appreciation of white terns. Um, if you go to whiteterns.org, you, you'll get to this website. It has lots of information you can find out, you can download. You can become a citizen scientist and help monitor white tern nests. And Rich is the main one helping to manage that right now. So he can help train you in where to, where to search for white tern nests, how to monitor them, and then we have a, a way you can upload your data into a database so it can become part of this research. So it's actually, I think, a really cool program. Rich, you've got like 20, 25 people signed up now? Great. Um, and then last, I want to have a plug here for the Mono Oku Festival, which we're going to have at Ilani Palace on May 20th from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Um, you'll start to see flyers about this, or, uh, around town about this. So I encourage you all to go and learn more about the Mono Oku. And I will stop right there. I know I already went over. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've got time for at least a few questions. Yeah. There is, absolutely. Uh, the white tern was really important for Polynesian navigators. Um, because they they don't make very long foraging trips, so uh, you know, like an albatross might be gone for a week at a time. So if you saw an albatross at sea, doesn't really mean that much about where land is. White terns go back to their nest every day. So Polynesian navigators realize this. If you see a white tern at sea, probably there's a good chance it's going to an island. And especially if he's carrying fish, you know it's going to an island. So the Polynesian navigators actually use white terns a lot in helping them find their way to islands, at least when, once they got close. Are they as noisy as sooty No, they're not as noisy as sooty terns. They make kind of a wicka 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 call, but not, not as noisy as sooty terns. You had a question too. If someone moves an egg on a branch to, like, say, a safer spot, if they're going to cut the branch, or move a chick, will the parents still parent that chick? Uh, it depends how far you move it. Um, in general, seabirds have really fine scale recognition of which, which egg is theirs. If you move it too far, they won't recognize it. Um, I have heard of people moving eggs very short distances over several days, but even a couple feet for an egg might be too far. Um, as the chicks get bigger, I think the parents are a lot more tolerant of that because the chick starts to wander around naturally on its own. But the egg, you really cannot move it very far at all. And same thing for a small chick. So in general, no. And if you did move it, you'd have to move it very gradually. Um, but especially if it's an egg, you know, the, the parents have chosen a good spot where the egg will balance. So you really, it's, it's hard to find a good spot close enough. Yeah, someone else, someone else in the back. You mentioned the red-tailed uh, birds that they mate over and over again together. Have they banded ones to show that for sure? Yes. Yeah, I haven't. I, I stopped banding the tropic birds here because they really don't like it. And to read the band number, you have to pick them up. Their legs are really short, and they essentially can't walk on land. They just kind of squat. 
So if, to read the band number and know whether it's the same bird, you have to pick them up each time. And they hate it. They scream and scream and scream, and they often regurgitate their food. So it's pretty disturbing to them, and I just decided it, it wasn't worth it. I mean, this is, it's not, this is not a major research project for me. It's kind of a fun thing that I started doing. Um, and also, this is a fairly public spot. I don't want to have people see me handling the birds, causing them what they view would view as, as harm, and then either saying, hey, that, you know, calling the police and saying, hey, that guy's harassing birds, or saying, hey, I'm going to go pick up one of those birds too. Um, anyway, I just decided it wasn't worth it. So there have been detailed studies elsewhere that have shown that birds will nest with the same mate year after year after year. And I assume they do the same thing here, but I haven't actually measured that myself. Are the breeding fairs site specific or tree specific? Yes, they are. Um, yeah, and again, uh, I didn't mention this. We are just starting to ban white turned chicks. I think we've banded 18 now. Um, and we hope they'll start coming back in a year, maybe two years, and start nesting themselves. Um, elsewhere, where they've had long term studies of white turns, about 75% of pairs will use the same site for successive nesting attempts. So mo most of them use the same site over and over. And the, sa the same is true for tropic birds. Did you ask about tropic birds or turns? The answer is the same. <laughs> <laughs> yes, question. No, not a question. Oh. Um, for one thing, thank you. I enjoyed this book. But people who know me know I am stickler for the correct pronunciation of Hawaiian words. Uh-oh. Yeah, we live in Honolulu, not Honolulu. OK. And on the <laughs> island of Oahu. Oh, and you have a komo mai. That's incorrect. It should be a hele mai. Because I, komo mai means to enter an enclosure. I did not make this poster. <laughs> so Mar Marjorie Ziegler did. You could talk to her. Marjorie Ziegler, the Conservation Council for Hawaii. I shall. Okay. Yes. Doctor, two quick questions. Yes. Do the tropic birds and the white turned birds ever fly at night? Uh, the white terns do sometimes, yes. They're, most of them settle down for the night and don't fly around too much, but some come back to their trees after dark. Second question. What is the longest known flight range of the white tern? Nonstop. I don't know. Um, you see them, you know, they're not, when, when they're not nesting, they might be, you know, hundreds of miles from the nearest land. So they, they can fly for days and days. When they have an egg or a chick, they come back every night. But if they're not nesting, they could be hundreds of miles out. So, yeah. I went to Newport and I saw a lot of white turns walking on the ground. It's really freezing out. You haven't seen any walking on the ground? No. No. I've seen them do that there, too. Um, that would be a bad idea here with all the, all the, the cats and mongoose and rats and whatnot. Um, yeah. No, I, I have not seen that.